super excited to be doing this this topic talking about um, tax saving strategies especially as we're getting close to the end of 2023 uh, before i start though i do want to put a disclaimer in there i am not a tax consultant i'm not a, an advisor and so you should before you make any decisions always make sure you talk to your cpa and your accountant to make sure that the changes the shifts that you're making make sense for your personal situation i wanted to put that out there but with that being said you know I think we often have this mentality where the new year starts, you have all these resolutions and you're all ex super excited about making shifts in the new year. What I love about the end of the year is that, you know, the next 30 days, I think you have these magical next 30 days where there's the, you have the ability to um, really transform things in the next 30 days. So I love the new year. I ha usually have resolutions, but I also have tons of resolutions for the, the last month of the year. So it gives me a 30 day sprint towards the end and that's where we are. So be it fitness goals, be it investing, be it saving dollars and taxes, it's a great time to get started. And I'm hoping that this uh, episode actually helps all of you with, with your last 30 days of 2023. 20, uh, um, strategy also. Okay. Welcome to Generational Wealth MD's podcast on financial freedom through investing in real estate. My name is Param Baladandapani. I'm a mom, radiologist, real estate investor, and mentor to others looking to start or scale their real estate portfolios. Thank you for being here today. The goal of this podcast is to provide you with inspiration, strategies, and insight so that you can stop trading your time for money and live life on your terms. If you love the episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. Okay, and typically when we do these tax related topics, I see the most interest. I saw a lot of you message me, send us emails saying, okay, this is amazing. We love these topics. Um, and, you know, it makes a lot of sense, right? Because most of us uh, are paying multiple six figures in taxes. I know I was for the longest time. Um, and if there is a way for us to legally keep more of our money in our pockets that makes absolute sense because saving a dollar is uh, the same as earning two dollars and you're able to take that money reinvest it and take advantage of the time value of money right so compound interest is supposed to be the eighth wonder of the world I agree that there is a huge value in being able to conserve money today and the strategies we're going to talk about are completely legal the tax code does favor business owners and real estate investors um, and so their incentives because as a business owner as a real estate investor you're actually stimulating the economy and this is how the irs rewards you for it so all of these are completely legal strategies um but and i have five strategies I want to touch upon today. Three of them are going to be applicable to most most people, right? To everyone. And then two of them are specific to people who either are business owners, real estate investors. Um, and so when I say business owner, even if you are a, a consultant, you get a 1099, you're a sole proprietor, that applies to you, right? Um, so there's something for everyone. Um, and I'd love to get started. But before we get started, um, I want, and I, I say this every time I talk about taxes, I think it's important for all of us to remember two key things, right? Whenever we're talking about tax saving strategies, it is super exciting. Uh, but remember, the key rule is always going to be don't let the tax tail wag the dog, right? So whatever move you make has to make logical sense and has to be the right move irrespective of whether you're getting the tax savings or not, right? That's the mo that's key. That's rule number one. And then Rule number two, um, because we're talking about tax strategies, I think this is important for everyone to hear. Any um, tax conserving strategy that you use, right? Any move that you make, you have to make sure that those deductions or those expenses um, that you're taking are ordinary to your business and then they are necessary, right? So it can't be excessive. It can't be something that doesn't make sense to your business um, and so just make sure that you're not letting the tax tail wake the dog and that um, everything that you do um, is ordinary and necessary for your business. So those are the key rules and now that we have that wrapped up, let's get started. If you're interested in learning how to invest in long-term and short-term rentals the right way so you can accelerate to financial independence with the support of mentorship, community, and vetted investor agents in strong markets across the country, then get on the wait list for the next cohort of Creating Generational Freedom at www.generationalwealthmd.com. 
You don't have to learn from decades of costly mistakes by yourself. The program is only open for enrollment in the spring and fall each year. In the last six months alone, our members have acquired over $60 million of real estate, and more importantly, they're living life and practicing medicine on their terms. You don't have to do it alone. get started. Okay, so I'm going to start off by talking about, uh, you know, the first two strategies we're going to talk about applies to everyone, right? You don't have to be a business owner, you don't have to own real estate to be able to use it. So we'll start off over there. The first one's going to be tax loss harvesting. Um, hopefully, some of you are already doing this. Um, tax loss harvesting is something that I do typically in the third quarter of the year because that's when i file my taxes my personal taxes that's when i look at my portfolio and i'm trying to streamline things and so i make sure that i'm always thinking about this you can do this before the end of the year so if this is something that applies to your situation you can still take advantage of it so um what is tax loss harvesting so i actually copied on a um, an actual description so i make sure that i'm explaining this correctly but tax loss harvesting is the selling of securities at a loss to offset capital gains tax owed, owed from um, selling profitable assets. So what does that mean? If I have certain, so I'll just talk about what I did this year, right? Um, during the pandemic, 2020, I was doing quite a bit of short-term trading, not necessarily day trading, but buying and selling um, stocks over the course of a week or a month. Now, the disadvantage of doing that is that it's speculative, number one. Number two, when you do that, you're subject to ordinary income tax, right? You, you have short-term capital gains. So if I made 10 grand, uh, I didn't necessarily make 10 grand because now I have to pay taxes at my marginal tax bracket. So I'm paying 50% in taxes. So I actually made five grand, right? So you're paying all of those taxes. Um, and so if, uh, well, anyway, so it's not necessarily the best strategies, but I acquired, um, you know, quite a few, um, single individual stocks in my portfolio, which I don't necessarily do. I prefer for the longer term to have index funds in my portfolio. But I had individual stocks, which uh, which may be true for many of you on here. Um, if that's what you were doing, if you looked at your portfolio now, a lot of them are possibly because they had uh, inflated values and a lot of them are possibly um, you're showing a loss. So a part of my portfolio, that, that part of my portfolio, I looked at it and I sold some of the um, the individual stocks that I did not want to hold in my portfolio portfolio for the long term, right? So if I had a loss over there, um, if I had a loss in those assets, when I sell that, so here's the thing, with tax loss harvesting, if you have losses, it's used to offset capital gains, right? But um, there's there's a there's a and you know useful tip over there is that the IRS allows you even if you don't have gains that you're realizing even if I didn't sell stocks for gains right this year but if I have up to three thousand dollars in losses from selling equities I can use that against my my W two or ten ninety nine active income right I can use it and to offset it um, to offset having to pay taxes on those three thousand dollars right so that's you know, time value money right there. That's money in my pocket today. Um, and if you have excessive losses, then it carries forward into uh, following tax years and you can use it against your W-2 income if you don't have capital gains to offset it, right? So in a way, if you're doing this, if you're regularly streamlining your portfolio, this can be beneficial to a lot of you, right? Um, and um, especially because uh, if you have gains, short-term gains that you're paying, um, you're paying that at marginal tax brackets and you use losses to offset it, but uh, it also helps you streamline your portfolio. Now, um, I, like I said, this is something I do on a regular basis, typically Q3 when I'm doing my taxes, but you can do it before the end of the year to take advantage of it. So if you've never done this before or considered it, I think this is a great time to think about it. Um, um, another caveat over there is something called the wash sale. If I sold, I also did this um in 2020 when I had I was trying to offload some of my Exxon um, and um, other oil and gas stocks and so if you have something that isn't performing well where you feel like you know it you don't have a good outlook for the foreseeable future and you want to um, get rid of it this would probably be the time to do it now um, like I said there's a caveat over there something called the wash sale if you sell Apple stocks that you acquired a few months ago at a loss today and you go ahead and within the next 30 days you purchase more uh, uh, you know more Apple stocks so 
technically if you're purchasing a substantially identical stock uh, within 30 days then um, you may not be able to use tax loss harvesting right um, and that's because it becomes a wash sale so that's something just to keep in the back of your mind but otherwise tax loss harvesting is something that most of you should be able to take advantage of okay um, strategy number two which also applies to most of us is going to be about maximizing your 401 and your 403b if that's what you continue to do now many of you are investing in real estate and who are, who are on here you're likely um you know um not doing that you're taking the money investing it in um real estate and then you're able to use depreciation to um to lower your tax burden that's probably what you're doing but for those of you who aren't necessarily doing that then this would be the time to ensure especially if you um haven't maximized um your your um contributions yet if you have a new employer and you shifted and you haven't really streamlined your deduction your um, contributions going towards your retirement funds um, this would be a good time to do it same thing for hsas if you're picking a high deductible plan with an hsa this is the time to make that decision um, and again hsas are really powerful tools also uh, make sure you understand how your hsa works because uh, they don't work the same in um different in every organization so if you have an hsa where you can you know carry forward those funds if you don't use them and uh and you can use it towards qualifying expenses you know anytime in the future then that's a powerful tool vehicle because what happens i believe it's after the age of 65 is that if you have excess funds in your hsa you can withdraw them at that point and they've grown um, you know, typically you're able to invest them in equities um, and they can they continue to grow. So they've grown tax free because, you know, you're not paying it's tax deferred money that you put in there. After the age of 65, you can withdraw that for any expense. It doesn't have to be a qualifying expense at that time. And your gains are not you know, taxed on your gains um, and you don't have to pay taxes at that point. Right. So it, it becomes super powerful uh, after a while. And this is the time to make that decision for 2024. Um, as far as Roth IRAs are concerned, hopefully, and I've talked about this in the past, if you're doing a backdoor Roth IRA um, and that works for, I still do a backdoor Roth IRA. And let me tell you why uh, the majority of my funds still go into real estate, but I do um, put a small amount of money into stocks every year, very small amount at this time, uh, based on where I'm in, in my portfolio currently. Um, and the reason is if you are investing your post-tax dollars in a brokerage account, you would want to consider possibly doing a backdoor Roth IRA. And, um, you know, a Roth IRA has income limits for most of us. Once you're, I believe it's about $150,000 of um, income as a couple, then you don't qualify to do a traditional um, IRA. You have to do, uh, or a traditional Roth IRA, you do have to do a backdoor Roth IRA where you're funding money into a traditional IRA first, your post-tax dollars, and then it goes into your Roth IRA. The advantage is, if you are going to be investing in stocks, if you do it in a brokerage account, when you pull the money out, you're paying gains, and you know, a lot of capital gains taxes. If you're growing it within the Roth IRA, you're able to, uh, you know, um, grow it tax um, without any tax implications, right? So they are post-tax dollars, but it grows and the gains, you don't have to pay taxes on the gains. So that's an advantage, but you have till April to do your backdoor Roth IRA. So that isn't necessarily something you want to, I mean, you could technically do it right now, but um, you have time. Um, so that's strategy number two. So we're done with two. I have one more strategy that everybody can use. That's going to be strategy number five. But three and four are specifically for those of you who are um, business owners or real estate investors. And so you could have a ownership interest in um, you know, um, an urgent care center, endoscopy centers, you could be um, a sole proprietor and be an independent contractor. So this applies to all those of you who uh, you know um who are who have your own business in that sense or own real estate um and so again this there are like five different things in here i'm trying to squeeze it into five uh just five categories but the overall the overarching theme is when you have a business or you own real estate this is also a good time to see if there is a way for you to reduce your overall income and to accelerate your expenses, right? When you do that, basically you're reducing your taxable um, income. And so as far as expenses are concerned, I think, um, you know, um, common ones that people typically tend to overlook are going to be 
A home office expense, if you have a dedicated space in your home, then you get to take a portion of your home uh, expenses, including property taxes, um, insurance, uh, home warranty, uh, you are, and you know the, mor the mortgage that you pay. So a portion of that can go towards your home office expenses, but it does have to be dedicated space, and it's going to be proportionate to the space that you have reserved for your home office, right? So that's one thing that people tend to overlook, so make sure, you know, you're factoring that in and if you do want to refresh that space rehab that space buy furniture for that space um this is probably the time to do it because then you get to uh, use those deductions for 2023 if you're buying equipment a computer all of that if you want to get it in before the end of the year that's going to be helpful i have one of my one-on-one -on -one coaching clients um her spouse is a she's a physician spouse is a general contractor they purchased a bobcat excavator um, and then that's something that can be depreciated and, and i believe because we have 80 percent um depreciation at this point they were able to do bonus depreciation and so um significant tax savings over there so this is the time to think about all of that um, in terms of repairs uh you know roof repairs anything that you're considering for your properties for your uh, business space this would be the time to think about it when it comes to deferring income can you postpone a sale to next year because you maybe you have you know significantly higher bonuses this year or your income is higher and you'll be in a lower tax bracket next year so strategizing over there you may have acquired more real estate next year to have more bonus depreciation although this is the last year for 80 percent bonus depreciation we're phasing things down so so it can be a little tricky over there but thinking about it um, at this point makes absolute sense same thing for donations right um, again if you are uh, if you're not itemizing deductions this may not be beneficial for you but if you are donating through your business uh, or if you are someone who gets to itemize deductions then think about not just cash donations think about non-cash donations if you have a cause that you want to donate to which again, this is something that I'm going to be doing in the next 30 days. Um, GW Gives is our charitable mission. And uh, every quarter we, are, uh, we, are, we have projects that we fund for children in rural India with thalassemia, blood disorders, hearing aids. I have something that I have to fund before the end of the year. Again, this is the time to make sure you're maximizing that um, so that you're able to take those deductions um, and use them in 2023, right? And it's same thing for non-cash donations. If you have... Uh, you know, equipment, uh, I have donated, uh, you know, furniture, large pieces, cabinets, um, um, you know, anything that is non-cash clothes, uh, anything that you want to donate. And if you're giving that, make sure you always have a receipt because your, uh, your CP is going to require that. But again, this is time to optimize that. Um, other ways that you can reduce your overall income by accelerating expenses if you have a dependent family member income shifting is something we've talked about all the time right if you have an, a dependent family member it could be uh, a child who can um, assist you in your business who may be under the age of 18 but they're able you have tasks that are age appropriate and you're paying them appropriate wages it could be dependent parents who are um you know who don't necessarily have any income at this point um, and so they have twelve thousand dollars of income that they can um, get tax free every year. So if you're employing a family member or if you have like a renovation project in your short term rental that you're trying to close before the end of the year and you have a family member who can assist you, uh, you can pay them up to $12,000 each and they don't have to pay taxes on it. And so that reduces your income if you and then they don't have to pay income taxes on it. And if uh, if if you're funding a child's Roth IRA, it goes in there and it's growing tax uh, deferred, I mean, tax free, and they never have to pay gains on it, right? So uh, it's also a good time to think about income shifting, you know, and but the again, over here, you want to make sure that the tasks are age appropriate, and you are paying them appropriate wages that you would pay someone else. So you want to make sure you're doing those things correctly. So that's as far as employing family members. And um, I think the last two things in this category are going to be education expenses if you are looking to purchase a course if you uh, are going to invest in coaching um, you know this would be the time to do it because you can take that as an expense in 2023 and finally business travel um, oftentimes you're looking to combine travel and uh, and business and you sh may be able to write off a lot of those expenses again here you want to make sure it's ordinary and necessary like we talked about and I actually have this in one of our blog posts where I go into detail but just a broad overview, just to make sure you're doing this correctly. Typically, you want to be doing the entire trip, at least you want to have greater than 50% of the time spent 
on business. Uh, a business day is at least four hours of work that is uh, related to your business, right? And uh, you want to make sure that you know the first few days and the la the first day and the last day are business really you have business related activities otherwise it can be hard to justify the entire cost of the trip and then you are going to prorate your stay based on your business days but if you're following certain rules then you may be able to combine if you're going to go check out your short-term rental uh in um the florida panhandle and you want to spend a couple of days on the beach you may be able to do it you know and take the kids along get them to help you in the rehab um as long as they are of the age where they're actually able to assist you, you may be able to pay them, right? So again, combination of all of those things, things to think about before the end of the year to see if you can reduce your uh, taxable income that way. Um, now, strategy number four is also applicable to those who have a business or real estate, even if you're a sole proprietor, this could apply to you. Um, this was a strategy and the end of the year is a very attractive time to do this. I did this a couple of years ago. Um, because it's also a good time from the perspective that uh, the car salesmen are trying to meet their Q4 and their 2023 goals. It's also a good time to negotiate with them because they have the next year's model out. And so I find that, you know, um, it, it's a very helpful time to go and buy a business vehicle. Um, and when you buy a business vehicle, um, and so for a vehicle to be considered, so there, there are two ways to get deductions for a vehicle, right? You can use a vehicle for business and then you're able to uh, take expenses based on your mileage and what you've, uh, how much you've used the vehicle for businesses. But if you buy a business vehicle um, that and you use it for greater than fifty percent, you use it greater than fifty percent of the time for a business for the for up to the next five years, you you meet criteria to be able to take more deductions, right? Section one seventy nine um, and bonus depreciation deductions. Now, this is the last year for 80% bonus depreciation. So if you purchase a business vehicle and you qualify for bonus depreciation because it is over 6,000 uh, pounds, the gross uh, vehicle or weight needs to be over 6,000 points. If that happens, then in addition to section 179 deductions, you're able to use bonus depreciation. So, um, so it's a unique way where if you purchase a certain class of vehicles, that could be, I believe the Audi Q7, um, the Beamer X5, uh, there's a the Mercedes GLE, uh, Model X Tesla, all of those do qualify because they're over 6,000 pounds. If you use them greater than 50% for business over the course of the next five years, they do qualify as a business vehicle and you are able to combine section 179 and bonus depreciation this year, this is the year, last year for 80%. So again, that's going to give you a, a boost. Um, last year, you were able to do 100% a bonus depreciation so you could depreciate the entire value of the vehicle if you used it a hundred percent for business purposes right so ways to strategize around that like i said always consult, uh, consult with your cpa to make sure you're doing this correctly for your individual situation right but especially if you're using the vehicle between now and the end of the year over a hundred percent and that's not that hard right if you're using it between now and the end of the year this calendar year a hundred percent for your business um, then you're able to increase your deductions and definitely talk to your CPA about it. But that's why I feel like this time of the year is a, it's a magical time of the year <laughs> to consider buying a business vehicle and be able to use those deductions. Um, and so, and that applies to both new and pre-owned vehicles. Um, and again, if you uh, purchase something that uh, a vehicle that has a, uh, an SUV with a gross vehicle or weight over 6,000 LBs, your um, able to also use bonus depreciation tag that on get a higher depreciation level otherwise i believe you're capped at um possibly ten thousand a little over ten thousand for year one and that's just section 179 deduction but you can phase it out and you can get it over the course of five years right so um again that's um, something that a lot of our real estate investors love to use and and those with businesses too okay so that's strategy number four let's move on to strategy number five and the reason it's strategy number five is because uh, I have some of the advanced tax strategies in there. But like I said, strategy five is something that applies to real estate investors, but is also something that any of you, even if you have an investor in real estate to date, can take advantage of. So let's let's deep dive. OK, um, so the first way real estate investors can really accelerate their tax savings and a time to really think about it end of year uh, is when you, if you're qualifying as a real estate professional um, now. 
If that is the case, then this is something you've been working towards from the beginning of the year. This is not something you can do at the end of the year. To qualify as a real estate professional, you need to spend 750 hours over the course of the year on real estate. And that has to be, and more than, um, more than time that you spend in any other income producing activity. So if you spend a thousand hours in medicine over the course of the year, you have to spend more time in real estate to qualify. And so you really, Ideally, you can't qualify as a real estate professional unless you're working 0.6 FTE or less, three days or less. Um, and um, this may apply to those of you who have a spouse who probably works part time. Then you may be able to tag team and one person qualifies as a real estate professional and they are able to shelter the other person's income from taxes. I we've had some of my clients have uh, coaching clients have sheltered over five hundred thousand dollars of their spouse's income from taxes using it. But again, this is not the time. This is the time for those who have planned for this strategically to make sure their execution is perfect. And if you are someone who are who's considering doing this next year, it's time to start planning for next year. Uh, but if you are qualifying as a real estate professional this year, you want to make sure your time logs um, are appropriate for real estate professional and for material participation, two separate criteria that you need to meet. You want to make sure you have logs for yourself and for anybody else working substantially in your business, because for material participation, you have to prove that um, unless you're hitting the 500 hours criteria, which you may most likely are, you want to make sure you have logs for others also. Now, um, same thing for those of you acquiring short term rentals. Now, a lot of you who are in the fall cohort of uh, creating generational freedom, the coaching program, you're in this boat. Um, and so if you are acquiring a short term rental, so for a real estate professional status, you're just streamlining things, right? You want to make sure you have your time logs. You want to make sure you met material participation. And if you haven't, you want to really accelerate getting those last few hours in to make sure you hit criteria before the end of the year, right? That's what you're doing now. How can those of you who are working full time or those of you who haven't really strategized over the course of the entire year to qualify as a real estate professional, are you still able to take advantage of, you know, 80 percent bonus depreciation this year and really shelter like multiple six figures of your clinical income from taxes? If you are looking at short term rentals, that's technically still possible. Like I said, many of you are in the program and you're already you've already locked your property in you have your strategy and so at this point again you want to make sure you're logging your hours and if you especially if you're investing in short-term rentals and you're trying to meet the the criteria is going to be 100 hours spent on your property and more than anybody else if that's the criteria then you want to have logs for yourself and your cleaners property managers general contractors anyone who's spending a significant amount of time on your short-term rental and want to make sure that you're exceeding the time that they are spending on it right so it's time to look at your logs and make sure you're really hitting material participation that's the time and you also want to make sure that before the end of the year you have two to three guests in the property right so you can actually audit proof yourself those are all things you want to do before the end of the year now if you haven't started yet do you still have time so it's technically the 30th of november um now the the, the only problem is ideally you want to find a property lock it in close on the property before the end of the year and you want to be able to um, place it in service and also get those few stays in before the end of the year so it's gonna be really really hard to do it now unless you're going to put in an all cash offer uh, and or you can really expedite closing in some way so putting an all cash offer in allows you to expedite closing you may be able to close in 10 days then you can get the prop place the property in service and get those few stays in otherwise you're on a very very tight time frame but if that's what you're going to do, then I guess it's still possible. But if you were to do that, we have a lot of our members who are doing that. And I know the last few years, we've had members who purchased multiple short term rentals and they were able to really um, shelter, you know, and the reason I say they were able to shelter over half a million dollars of clinical income from taxes is because there's a limit. That's what you can do in a given year. You can't exceed $524,000 in um, income sheltering. Anything in excess of that in terms of losses gets carried forward, right? And that's why people stick to that number and they strategize around that number. But that being said, this is again another time where I want to stress those two rules that I mentioned at the beginning. Rule number one, don't let the tax tail wag the dog. Your short term rental has to make absolute sense as a standalone property after you stress test it from an income perspective. 
without the tax savings being factored in. Otherwise, you're doing yourself a disservice, right? But that being said, if it is the right property, um, and um, we've done multiple podcast episodes on how you vet a property, how you make sure you stress test it, um, how you pick the right market, and how you run your numbers, right? All of that is in... Um, um, is in our prior podcast episodes. And that's what we do within the coaching program. It's like really helping you to make sure you acquire the property correctly, how uh, get it and place it in service, and then how you manage the property going forward because it doesn't end over there. You want to be doing all of this and running it efficiently, right? But if you're doing all of that right and it is the right property, then technically you still could get in before the end of the year if you have a really uh, short escrow. Um, and then you're able to place it in service before the end of the year. And the the tax code as it stands doesn't necessarily need you to have those sh- short-term stays, but having those two to three short-term stays, like less than seven days average guest stay, that really audit proofs your, um, uh, your return. And so if ideally you want to be getting that in also. Okay, perfect. We talked about reps. We talked about short-term rentals. Um, let's talk about those of you who may you know, who are trying to do what we call a lazy 1031. What's a lazy 1031? If I sold a property, and this applies to so many investors, who, especially long-term rentals, you know, doing a lot of uh, investing, a lot of long-term rentals, you purchased a property, you sold it for a gain in March, and now you're looking, now you have all the, you know, you know that in 2023, you're going to have gains tax, um, especially if it's short-term gains, if you sold it within a year, you're going to pay marginal income taxes on it. Otherwise, it's going to be long-term capital gains, right? And you're looking at it and you're saying, end of the year, what can I do now to reduce my tax liability? Um, What you could do is what we call a lazy 1031. So if you haven't necessarily purchased another property with those proceeds, you could still technically, as long as you close before the end of the year and you place it in service. So even if you could list it on the 31st of December if it's for a long-term rental, guys. This is not for a short-term rental. Then technically, you could do what we call a lazy 1031. The gains that you have to pay can be offset by, if you place this new property in service, you could bonus depreciate it in 2023, and you could offset the cap, the gains tax you have from the other property. And so you're not necessarily sticking to the timeframes of a traditional 1031, but it essentially gives you the same benefits where you're able to use, uh, you're able to offset having to pay those capital gains. You're deferring it essentially uh, because you have, you know, bonus depreciated the new property. So um, that's something to think about. Uh, again, really tight timeframes. You may be able to close expire if you have a good lender or if you're paying all cash, but you will have to place it in service uh, before the end of the year. So it has to be in service on the 31st of December for a long-term rental to qualify. But that's something else to think about um, if that's the boat you're in. Okay. This may not apply to a lot of you. Uh, and so this next strategy is something that everyone can take advantage of. This is what I was talking about. If you are a passive investor, if you've invested passively in real estate and you're trying to take advantage of 80% bonus depreciation because this is like the last month for you to um, invest in a property, and then this is the time to do it. If you've never invested in real estate and you have been thinking about the tax efficiencies and you really want to start being more tax efficient uh, and uh, you know knowing that this is the last year for 80% bonus depreciation, it goes down to 60% next year, you want to be able to invest and this is for passive investors, right? You want to be able to invest passively. You could still technically do it before the end of the year, as long as the property uh, closes before the end of the year, right? Um, And so not a lot of projects to pick from, but if that's something you want to do, you can still do it. We have our latest deal in Atlanta. It's generationalwealthmd.com slash Atlanta three in lowercase. Um, we are near near we'll be past the funding deadline we still have a very limited spots two or three spots because some people weren't able to fund because they ended up purchasing um, a primary home or investing in a short-term rental so we have a few spots left because people weren't able to fund for personal reasons because they are because of other alternate investments so if you want to take advantage we have that opportunity um but if you're looking at other passive investment opportunities this is the last month to do it, still get advantage of 80% bonus depreciation and still get those losses to be used um, towards your 2023 returns. Now, um, the thing to remember is that when you're investing passively, uh, what do you do with those losses? How does it affect you? So you get on your K-1, you still are able to take advantage of depreciation, which is one of the biggest tax incentives that real estate investors get, even when you're investing passively, right? So you get those losses, you can use it right away to offset any other passive income that you have. This can be gains from selling 
real estate, right? Um, and if that's considered passive income, this could be passive income from your ownership interest in any other business that you are not materially participating in. We have a lot of physicians who have ownership interest in surgical centers, in um, endoscopy uh, suites, urgent care centers, where they're not actively running it, they're receiving passive income. So you could use it to offset that. And so there you're automatically immediately getting the tax benefits and um, you have time value of money and all of those beautiful things, right? Um, so passive income, passive gains can be offset by the passive losses you get from investing in syndications. Um, if you're having depreciation recapture from another syndication that you're exiting, you can use these losses towards that. Um, and, and if you don't have any of those circumstances, you will still be able to use those losses towards any distribution that you receive going forward. And then those distributions, because of these passive losses, become tax-free essentially. I was just talking to one of my friends who invests in my deals um, and he has over a half a million invested in our deals uh, and he is throwing out between thirty to forty thousand dollars in passive income every year not from sales or equity buildup or that's just cash flow that he's getting as he's holding these assets. He's going to get a big bump in, um, um, in uh, equity and uh, and gains like he's going to get a huger bump towards the end as these assets as we exit these assets but even as he's holding them um he's getting um you know between most people get between five to seven percent from cash flow right and so that becomes essentially and so it's funny how i try to explain i you know I keep trying to explain how that is tax-free income but sometimes it doesn't seep in but that it does become tax-free income um because you now have, uh, because you have these passive losses that you're able to get and you're getting higher passive losses than you would next year because we'll only have 60% bonus depreciation and you have 80% uh, bonus depreciation right now. So that's something to keep in the back of your mind um, when you're thinking about, okay, how can I really maximize my tax savings right now, between now and the end of the year? I think that's something that is really important and it's something that any of you can use. Uh, and there are very few projects that will close before the end of the year. And if you're considering doing it, then make sure if you are looking at our uh, at the project we have in Atlanta, Stewart's Mill. Again, it's generationalwealthmd.com slash Atlanta three in lowercase. Um, we just have a few spots left. And so so just make sure you go take a look at the offering um, and soft commit. Reach out to our team. It's going to be on a first come first fund basis at this point. But uh, we still do have some availability in that if you're looking at other opportunities again remember how this plays into the overall picture and it's st you still have the ability to take advantage of 80 percent bonus depreciation okay now that being said i want to go back to the basic rules i think a question that i often get when we talk about real estate professional status or short-term rentals is um, cost segregation. Do I have to get cost segregation done before the end of the year to be able to take advantage of uh, the tax savings? The answer is no. You do need to, you can, you have time. Cost segregation has to be done prior to tax filing. So you have time to do it, especially if you're filing for an extension. But I want to go back to the basic rules over here. Again, everything has to be ordinary. All the expenses that you're logging have to be ordinary and necessary. But more importantly, do not let the tax tail wag the dog. If you are looking at short term rentals, the numbers have to make absolute sense without factoring in the tax savings. Okay, if you are looking at a syndication opportunity, um, I want you to do your own due diligence. This is why we put out the, the guide, the passive investors handbook. Uh, it's a, you know, um, way for you to really understand how to do your own due diligence, vet the deal, the market, the sponsor. That's Again, that is generationalwealthmd.com slash guide in lowercase. Make sure you download that. Take a look at it. Um, do not let the tax sale whack the dog. You have to make sure the investment makes absolute sense. The deals we've gotten into the last two deals, the DSCR, which means the cash flow in these deals is close to, uh, is close to two, which means that there's so much cash flow going in from day one that we have an um, um, a, a buffer where, you know, even if for any reason, um, occupancy drops, um, or, uh, income from the property drops, we still have a buffer where typically then that number needs to be above 1.25 to be a healthy investment. The deals we're going in, um, the last few have had a DSCR close to two, and that just signifies, you know, strengthen the deal. Uh, Stewart's mill, we have fixed interest rate for the next five years 
that's close to 6%. Um, occupancy in the property is 94%. That's how you make sure the deal makes absolute sense. And the guide is a way for you to have a quick checklist. I have a due diligence checklist in there, like 10 questions you need to be asking to see if the deal makes sense for you, first of all, um, and also to see if overall, you know, it is a healthy deal that you're getting into. Those things become important. So don't let the tax tail wag the dog. I know we're talking about tax saving strategies, but that's the key concept to go with, to take away. And if you are considering Stewart's Mill, act fast, don't have too much space. And if you do want to have a call with me, um, I think you should be able to do it on the uh, the Stewart's Mill offering page has a link for book a call. I, I think it's really important for you. Like I said, make sure it makes sense for you, uh, for your portfolio overall. That's going to depend on your goals, where you are in your investing journey, how old you are, how much longer you intend to work. Um, you know, what's your risk appetite is. There's so many things to factor in. So there's not one answer for uh, for that, you know, makes sense for everyone. And the same thing applies to your tax situation. Um, again, I'm not a tax consultant or a CP CPA. So if you're going to take any of the, uh, the strategies I talked about and implement them, make sure you talk to your CPA. But that being said, I still think I want to go back to how the next 30 days, I will really want you to add momentum to your strategy like i said the new year is a great time to add momentum but oftentimes what i find is like you know you have so much time in the year you have the next 12 months to get to your goal there isn't enough momentum um isn't enough action taking because of that i love the end of the year because you have 30 days to really use some of these strategies uh and have you know take massive action and have a huge impact um so um let me know which ones made the most sense for you uh, and what you loved. And uh, I'd love to get feedback. So again, rooting for you guys, uh, 30 more days to go and let them be super exciting and uh, powerful.